welcome to For the Record. On this program, we talk about events and issues that are of interest to Sudbury. Today I have with me Fire Chief Michael Dunn. Chief Dunn is going to talk to us about fire safety, fire prevention, and what his department can do for you in times of crisis. Chief, you've grown up here in Sudbury. Yes. I imagine you can remember what it was like then and what it's like now. Sudbury has changed quite a bit over the years, and the fire department has changed right along with it. Yeah, you were once a volunteer force. Uh, yes, we were volunteer force. Uh, most of the, the men that are on the department now were appointed uh, after 1965, after the mid-60s. Uh -huh. A lot of that was due to the Wayside Inn Fire of 1965. The town made a commitment to upgrade our department. Now, we hear references to the Wayside Inn Fire a couple of, you know, quite a bit. We've had two of them, haven't we? That's correct. 1955 uh -huh. in 1965. Now, in the first one, didn't we lose quite a bit of the original building, or were you involved? I wasn't involved, involved in 55. Uh -huh. That's a little before my time. Um, uh, in 55 fire, and it occurred uh, in the middle of the winter. They had to chop uh, ice in the ponds behind it to get water, and a lot of the inn was lost. Uh -huh. um, the fire in 1965 uh, was not nearly severe. It was uh, discovered quickly because the, the inn at that point had a new fire alarm system in it. And Franco Pius tells me, in this, to this day, you can listen to the to the recordings at the, uh, that he had listened to, and the fire dispatcher getting the first call from the inn already told him the apparatus was on the way because the alarm system had already come into the fire station. So we got a pretty good jump on that. Now, is this in the days when Leo Quinn was manning the fire uh, control out at the Loring Parsonage? I'm not sure if Leo was there then, but uh, uh -huh. for many years. That's where the, the full-time person of the fire department lived, was in the Loring Parsonage. Uh, Leo lived there, and then after Leo, Bernie Darby lived there. Yeah, so he was it. He was the one man. He was the one man. He received the phone call, know. ran next door, turned on the whistles for the volunteers <laughs> to come, uh, and then he got the first truck and got out the door. Now, getting back to our first truck, is that what one of these pictures is over here? I believe. We brought some pictures here, and I believe oh. one of them uh, is... If it's not Sudbury's first truck, it's certainly one of the first mm -hmm. trucks the town owned. Well, let me look at this one over here. Now, okay. I see the ladder is beside the truck mm -hmm. over here, and that must have been manually operated. Oh, yes. It's a, a manual ladder, um, and as you can see, it, the fellow had to get out, could only get out one side of the truck because the ladder was sure. blocking the other entrance way uh, on that truck. Okay, and what happens with the fire hose over here? The fire hose on top there was, uh, you'd have to pull that off manually, and you'd have to rewind mm -hmm. it manually, whereas today's trucks are all on electric rewind wheels. Um, you can notice it has a very, very small pump on the front of it to pump water. Um, today's pumps pump over 1,000 mm -hmm. gallons a minute, and we depend highly on the town's uh, water distribution system, the fire hydrants. But this pump, at least, was operated by the engine, wasn't it? It was operated by the engine, yeah. It seems to me I can remember seeing fire engines where the firemen themselves, or firefighters, literally had to do the pumping that oh, dropped true. the water That's true. You can go, go to okay. musters and watch them pump like that. Uh, now, this picture is taken on Concord Road, isn't it? This is on Concord Road, yeah. just before you get to Sudbury Center, and the building mm -hmm. that's, that it's going by is the old mm -hmm. post office, uh, just about where Heritage Park is today. Okay, and you said that the uh, boxes now from the old post office are still in existence. I believe they? they're still in existence, and they're at uh, the uh, Wayside Country Store mm -hmm. up in Marlboro. Now, when did it start growing from the volunteer force? You mentioned that the inn, the fire at the inn, was one of the reasons why they now have a full-time firefighting That was force. one of the reasons, and I yeah. think the other was reasons that were is that uh, as Sudbury grew and became mm -hmm. more of an affluent community, there were less people here mm -hmm. uh, to respond during the day to fire calls. Uh, yes, it used yeah. to be that employers would let uh -huh. people come out and go to a fire if the whistles blew, and as the town changed, uh, business left the town, industry left. Yeah. Farmers uh, were no longer able to drop their hoes in the yes. yeah. in, uh, in, and run off to yeah. the fires, so the town had to come up with something else. Don't we have a regulation that the buildings can only be so high because of the fire equipment that we so have? So has a 35-foot oh. building height. Mm -hmm. So that hasn't changed any at that all. That hasn't still, changed. We're still okay. with that. So if that were to change, it would mean getting all new equipment, too, then, wouldn't it? It would mean some new equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about that. Uh, one of the proposals mm -hmm. that Mr. Tyler brought before town meeting this year would have uh, mm -hmm. allowed the Sperry site to have raised. Yeah. Uh, we would have probably needed some new equipment. Mm -hmm. What did we do to raise money before? I can remember some of the old-time... Uh, 
4th of July. Prior to events. raising taxes every time we needed money, we, yes, we used to run our own <laughs> events. Uh, the firefighters, for many years, the Sudbury Firemen's Association ran the uh, field day on the 4th of July. <laughs> it was about a three day carnival type of event over at uh, the Noy School Playgrounds. Full carnival, bingo games. Uh -huh. uh, and most of our money was made through bingo. And if we have Lenny Pike, uh, keeping the engines in order for us too. Wasn't that sort of part of the volunteer end of it? Uh, Somehow he's the trucks coming were into main, memory. The, here, I'm yeah. not sure about Mr. Pike, but I know yeah. many of the, all of the trucks were maintained by volunteers and people within mm -hmm. the town. Yeah, so if something happened to one of the engines, whoever was a good mechanic whoever at the Whoever was time, a good mechanic just, and there were mechanics on the department would always help yeah. out and get them back and fixed. Okay. And, How about this other engine that I see over here? This has got to be engine number one, but this one now looks like it's got a little more sophisticated equipment over here. Well, the hoses on this one are for uh, drafting water up out of uh, ponds. Again, mm -hmm. you know, before the time the town had a fire hydrant system, yes, we mm -hmm. carried the helmets right on the trucks so that when mm -hmm. the volunteers got there, I'm sure that the packs that are underneath probably contain the coats. Mm -hmm. And so that when the fellows got to the fires, their gear was there for them. Yeah, now everybody has their own now individual every, gear. Everybody has their own individual gear today, um, and that's mm -hmm. probably one of the major changes in the in the firefighting field since mm -hmm. I've been on, is just the improvement in the protective mm -hmm. clothing the guys use. Well, that's true, too, because it would be very dangerous for them going into some of these places. And do we have gas masks and that sort of thing here? Because I guess toxic fumes is another big problem. Right. We use um, air, compressed air. Mm -hmm. People call them gas masks, it's the mask okay. with the bottles on them. Um, uh -huh. Some people call them oxygen bottles, but they're not. Oxygen yeah. is highly flammable, so they're, it's oh, compressed air. Yes, yes. Um, okay. Called self-contained breathing apparatus, SCBAs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's enough on every truck, so all the people that are on duty plus the off-duty people would get a bottle mm -hmm. when they arrived at a fire scene. And they're not allowed to go into a, a burning structure without one on. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes good sense. You don't want to lose a firefighter. <laughs> when you're going out to save somebody uh, somebody else. And I see that Sudbury was a first. Sudbury uh, was a first at uh, one yeah, time. <laughs> on, uh, on this, so tell me a little bit about what they were talking about here. I, I see that Sudbury's the first to mobilize, and then it goes on to saying they lead on the volunteer fire departments in using this particular equipment on the, uh, what is it, the mobile radios? Sudbury was one of the first communities uh, mm -hmm. in the nation to put radios in their truck so that the fire mm -hmm. station could talk to the vehicle on the way to a fire. Oh, uh, prior to that they were able to announce the calls to people's houses but when the truck got there he couldn't relay information back so that you would know what was stations. happening back at the uh, station. In the cities uh, at this time they used the neighborhood call box. There was a little phone oh. in there and they would go over to that and they would relay the message right back through the fire alarm system. All right, now these were the big red boxes you would see on the, on the corner street corners in, in the cities. of the uh, cities. And until you mentioned that, I hadn't noticed, but I guess they've pretty much disappeared. Uh, if they're, some of the cities still have them, but they're mostly yeah. used now by the police officer on a beat if he's still out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. you can call in on those. Use them. Yeah, I suppose that predates the time when most people had a phone. If they saw a fire, Certainly. they would have to go to the fire box. They pull ran the to the fire alarm box and they called. Yeah. Them. Right. Whereas now, if you see a fire, you're more apt to, uh, to use the phone to do that. So where, where are we at now then? We went from a volunteer force, which could have been any number, really. You never knew who was going to show up. That's right. And that's so. one of the big uh, drawbacks to a volunteer force. Uh, uh -huh. If you catch them right after supper time, you probably get a large turnout. If you try them uh -huh. at noon, you might have to wait 10 or 15 minutes to uh -huh. get enough people. And uh, okay. that still happens in area towns today that I know that have a volunteer. One day you'll uh -huh. hear them and they've got plenty of help. And the next time they put a call out, uh, there's nobody there sure, for quite knows. some time. I think it's uh, interesting. There are still a lot of towns in Massachusetts that do operate on a volunteer yes. fire force. Just about so, almost so. all the communities except uh -huh. the large cities west of Worcester are still a volunteer force. Can you give us some ideas now, Mike, about fire prevention and then lead me into a little bit about fire safety? What are some of the things people can do to make sure they don't have a problem start? Okay. Well, one of the first things everybody should do is talk to their children about having an escape plan from the house. We call it um, mm -hmm. Operation Edith or escape drills in the home. Mm -hmm. okay. And we tell people to practice what they're going to do. At least let the children know what they want them to do. Put mm -hmm. the smoke detectors in and when the smoke yeah. detector goes off that everybody goes outside and possibly meets at the mailbox or at the end of the driveway. Um, 
constantly reading articles in the paper where somebody went back in the house because they, they thought somebody realize. was still in yeah. and that person got out the back window but didn't come around to the front yard. Uh, mm -hmm. So families know what to do. So you should have a central meeting Central place. meeting spot. So everybody shows up there and you know who is right. out of the building. And it's okay. a good idea you know, to practice that a couple times a year mm -hmm. to refresh the kids' memories. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing people should do is you know, if they're having um, a wood stove, which causes a lot of problems in town, is mm -hmm. to be sure they have a chimney sweep clean it once a year. They all build up creosote, even the ones that the manufacturers tell you are Don't. almost uh -huh. creosote free, they do build they do. up creosote. So have okay. the chimney swept by a professional sweep. All right, this is attached to the uh, fireplace chimney, is that how this Well, some of them put them right into the existing fireplaces. Mm -hmm. Some people add new chimneys for them. Uh, okay, so it could Whether it way. could be a masonry chimney built mm -hmm. out of brick or it could just be a steel chimney that you see uh, mm -hmm. come up through the home. That would be inside the home? Inside the chimney. home. Okay. Yep. So you're saying that the creosote would catch fire? The creosote catches fire oh. and uh, mm -hmm. it heats up. You actually have a fire inside the chimney. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if the, the masonry in the chimney and the tiles mm -hmm. are loose, uh, that gives the fire a place to get out and before the, it's in the wall or it gets into the attic uh, and the homeowner mm -hmm. doesn't okay. know that that's occurring. Then, uh, so that's okay. important. Um, be sure to have your electrical service uh, up to the proper size. If you notice that when your appliances are coming on, other your lights all dim in the house, then you probably don't have the proper size electrical wiring. Yeah. Um, well, I blow a fuse if I put in a microwave and a toaster at the same time. Okay. Now, does that mean my wiring isn't strong enough? It, prob snuff, it probably means that your wiring in that circuit uh, uh -huh. isn't isn't strong enough for what yeah. you're trying to do with it. Um, so as when homes were wired. 30, 40 years ago, they, yes, will, yeah. they probably had 60 amp service. And then we went up to 100 amp service, and now mm -hmm. new homes all have 200 amp service. Okay. That's because we didn't have uh, air yeah. conditioners and uh, yes. electric dryers and all these things when homes were built. People have continued to add all these appliances without upgrading the electrical services. Now, how would I find out what I have, whether it's 60 amp or 100 amp? Where, where do I look? Do I go down and look at my you fuse get box? Down. See, I still have a fuse box. That's <laughs> okay, you can go down to your fuse yeah. box if you still have a fuse uh -huh. box, um, okay. and you can count up the fuses and number of oh, fuses. All right, all right. It so will, if I just it will give you a those. pretty good idea of what you've got in there for service. Um, all right, now to do that, I would have to make sure that I'm using 15 amp. I mean, there are 20 amp fuses and that's 15 right. amp fuses. And Most of them yeah. in homes that way should have a 15 amp fuse yes, in there. Yeah. And again, that's something people do too. Is they start to blow the 15 amp fuse, they put a 20 in, and when mm. the 20 is no longer yeah. sufficient, they'll put a higher one in, and that overheats the wiring, mm -hmm. and they have uh, fires. Yes, I understand that that's something you don't do. That you that's right. Don't you use never a higher amp fuse put a higher one in. That's your safety is the fact that it blows on you. That's right. To, uh, to let you know about that. That's right. Okay, I'll have to go take a look. All right, what's another thing I can know? Uh, well, uh, do, uh, unattended cooking is a big problem yeah. for us, uh, especially with mm -hmm. children. Um, come home from school and put the oil on for french fries or the oil on for popcorn uh -huh. and then go in the other room and get on the telephone or something with a friend and the oil, the Just Western oil or whatever, heats up yeah. in the pan and ignites and catches the yes. kitchen cabinets. That has been a problem over the years. Uh -huh. The smoke detectors are making a great uh, yeah. help in that regard because as the pan gets hot enough and it starts to smoke now, the smoke then detectors are going you. off and they run back in before yeah. it ignites. But we have had some serious fires because of that. Now, are smoke detectors mandatory in new homes? Smoke detectors are mandatory in new homes, and in new homes they must be interconnected. Uh, one smoke detector goes off, they all ring. Oh, okay, uh, because I've seen the, I'm, I'm going to call them portable ones, mm -hmm. the battery-operated The battery-operated ones. They're not are, connected with each other. They're not connected. But mm -hmm. those are acceptable for homes that were built prior to 1975, mm -hmm. but they are required in all homes that are being resold. So if you're going to be selling your house in the town of Sudbury, mm -hmm. you need a uh, certificate from the fire department saying you have the proper oh, amount okay. of detectors. Now, how many would that be? Does it, of course, it depends on the size it of your house. depends on but, the house. Uh, what would be your basic number three? Are they hallways, bedrooms, kitchen? With, where are the likely places to put the, these? The code is very specific as to where they have to be. They have to be on oh, the ceiling okay. at the base, on the ceiling at the base of every stairwell, and they also have to be in the sleeping area. Mm -hmm. 
which in most houses that means a detector at the base of the cellar stairs, at the base of the first floor stairs, mm -hmm. and then in the hallway then, upstairs okay. by the by the bedrooms. So it sounds like a minimum of three. Usually a minimum of three. That you would be talking about. Whereas in a ranch okay. style home, uh, we have some ranch homes in suburbs that don't have basements. Uh, some mm -hmm. of those can get by with just one. So it varies. I can remember some time ago a fire now up in the North Sudbury area. Don't you have certain fire codes that you have to meet in the fire breaks in the walls, something that was supposed to stop a fire from spreading rapidly? Well, Don't we have that kind of protection? We too? do have that kind of protection today. Uh, we didn't many years ago, and I'm sure one of the uh, mm -hmm. reasons the wayside didn't burn so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fully the first time it burned, yeah. called, we call balloon frame construction, and there are no fire stops in it. It's, wide open from the uh -huh. cellar right up through to the roof within uh -huh. the open channels. Sure, um, so it's just today's, right on they, put, they put actually two by yeah. fours actually in between the framing members uh -huh. so that a fire, it, it's almost compartmentized and it, it can't spread that quickly. And insulation in the homes these days slows the fires down too. Yeah, in the because walls. that's fire retardant, isn't because it? Because fiberglass is fire retardant, it's in the walls and it mm -hmm. slows the fires down. Do we get many home fires in Sudbury? We've been very, very fortunate uh, yeah. the last few years that we haven't. Mm -hmm. um, a lot it's of that I credit yeah. to the smoke detectors. In fact, the last mm -hmm. two serious fires we've had in Sudbury, one mm -hmm. uh, was caused by arson, the people were not at home. Right? Fire was set, and the other one was uh, when a family had gone away for the day. We traced the origin back to an appliance in the kitchen, mm -hmm. but nobody was home, and so the fire was not seen until it was well really advanced sure. and, and coming mm -hmm. out through the roof in the back of the home. Yeah. Well, they tell me that a toaster and an iron are the two worst culprits as far as uh, fires starting. And automatic coffee makers. Uh, yeah, okay. They're right up there with them, mm -hmm. too, especially the ones that. Uh, you can program to come on at, say, 5 or 6 oh, o'clock okay. in the morning for you, mm -hmm. and uh, we've had, there's been problems with those. Now, is this because they use a lot of current? I mean, does that make them Some more dangerous than something else? That they use a lot of current. Um, mm -hmm. The timers fail, and they'll come on before, um, before mm -hmm. the water starts to okay. come down into the, the coffee maker. Oh, right. So the unit's right. heating up, but there's nothing there's there for nothing it to heat. There. So okay. the plastic gets hot and ignites. So that would not be as likely to be a problem with a timer that puts on lamps. That's right. For instance, because, because if a lamp comes on so what earlier right. than, uh, than it should, that's not a big problem. Okay, so I can understand that. And I suppose there's the perennial smoking in bed type of thing that... Uh, Which has really dropped off because less and less people smoke. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, another good... There's, uh, there is some federal legislation that's being proposed to mm -hmm. uh, have cigarettes that will extinguish themselves right? if they're not uh, continually puffed on they will go out <laughs> and uh, the tobacco industry uh -huh. is working with Congress on developing such a such a product they may be going back to cornfield right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. never having had a problem with uh, with smoking it's uh, not one of the things I worried about but I find that interesting that they will literally have one that can go out by itself that's a break for the rest of us uh, yeah yes <laughs> not, uh, having a care for other people's smoke now, the fire department does a lot more than just fire prevention, fire safety. Mm -hmm. You do go around to the schools, too, don't you? We still have programs these, in the schools. Uh, mm -hmm. These things, too. So do you have a firefighter that is assigned to go around to uh, Yes. Uh, at the present kids? time, it's uh, Lieutenant George Moore, and mm -hmm. he visits right. the, the schools true. and uh, puts on programs for the kids. Mm -hmm. He, uh, I started one of the programs many years ago and, and used to do uh, the kindergarten mm -hmm. level. Uh -huh. All the kindergartens, and I had a fellow take over. Mm -hmm. Jack Boland did it for a few years after I made chief. Uh, Jack has since gone on to the Worcester Fire Department. Oh, is that right? So, He's graduated. So George has uh, mm -hmm. taken it over. George mm -hmm. did a lot of work, I know, this year with the second grade students. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and you find that they're receptive enough and that they know what you're saying? We they're find conscious. they're very receptive, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. we always give them something mm -hmm. to take home to their parents because from yeah, kindergarten yeah. to second grade, parents listen to whatever the kids bring home. It's oh, something that. that if they have a handout to bring home, they will talk about it at the dinner table, uh -huh. we found. And so, uh -huh. it's so you literally have prepared material. Then we have prepared material for, for the kids. And I'm right. sure one of them is what you've already mentioned to me, that to go out and have a specific meeting place That's right. when you know there is a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that a lot of people are lost more from the toxic gases or smoke inhalation than they are from the fire itself or from being burned, I guess is what I want to say. Are there any hints you can give us about how to avoid inhaling smoke, what are the kinds of things okay. we can do? 
if the smoke detector does go off and it's nighttime, uh, we advise people not to sit up or stand up in their bedroom quickly from a sleeping position. If they rise right up, there may be hot gases at that level. Mm -hmm. uh, smoke, uh, the hot gases tend to rise and be get at the ceiling level and then come back down to lower mm -hmm. themselves down. Okay. So if people hear that detector and they wake up and sense something is wrong in the room, they roll out of bed, stay close yeah. to the floor. We tell the kids get low and go. Uh huh. Okay. And, if, and that's the secret okay. is to stay low to the floor. Um, this is why dogs and cats don't usually perish in house fires uh -huh, because, because they're, they're very so they're low to down. the floor. They're mm -hmm. down at that level yes. um, and they'll get right out. We can take mm -hmm. people back into a home after it's burned mm -hmm. and usually show them that the soot lines come down so far, and then it's clear the soot hasn't gone okay. all the way to the floor line. And say so that if you would crawl along so in that out, line, you, know, you could have gotten you get out. You've a much better, uh, much much better, better chance, chance of getting out. Of, uh, and I suppose, I know it's hard to tell people this, but don't go back after a pet. Don't go back. <laughs> As I said, you know, the yeah. dogs and cats seem to survive. Uh, yes, yeah, they can, they can manage a lot uh, Right. A they lot they get down much lower to the floor. What's this other trick I've heard of... Um, wetting towels or damping towels and breathing through them if you have to. Well, if you really have to, but again, if, if people would have a, a plan, they might probably get yeah. out of the house and with rather the smoke detectors rather than have to re resort or something mm -hmm. like that. But if you really, really had to, uh, by putting a wet towel or something at your face, mm -hmm. it can give you that extra... Gives you a little filter action It's kind of a little filter that, action, yeah. but it, and it also... Uh, mm -hmm means there's something cool between your lungs mm -hmm. okay. as you're breathing out. Mm -hmm. If you have to take that extra breath to get out of the house, mm -hmm. you're not pulling in the super hot air. The, that super hot air has to come through the cool, mm -hmm. wet towel. It's going to slow it down a little so that you don't burn your lungs mm -hmm. in getting out. But really, the secret okay. is to get out before it ever gets that bad. Yes, and there's, we're, again, we keep coming back to the smoke detector, which the is what smoke takes detector you out, gets uh, out early enough. Now, I know this wasn't always a part of the fire department, but the um, emergency medical technician now is very much a part of your training and a part of the fire department. Uh, the emergency uh, medical technician, the ambulance service, probably accounts right now for more than 50% of our activities. That's um, uh, okay. We really have evolved over the years uh, from putting out lots of fires. And mm -hmm. when I first came on the department, that's basically all we did was go to fires. Mm -hmm. Uh, occasionally, you'd go to the hospital in the back of a police station wagon. And, uh, <laughs> we don't have police station wagons Police station anymore, wagons anymore, anymore now. Yeah. But that's what—that's how you used to get taken to the hospital. You, get, you know, it was uh -huh. kind of a uh, scoop and yeah. shoot, as we'd call it. You scoop them up off the street, <laughs> throw them in the back, and race to a, to an so area hospital. hospital. Yeah. Uh, but now the town you've got its first ambulance yeah. in 75, 76, 1976. Okay, so it isn't that long. So it's almost say yeah. 10, 13 years mm -hmm, somewhere in that mm -hmm. vicinity. Uh, most of the men on the department now are trained emergency medical technicians. Mm -hmm. Does everybody have to be trained or do you just have to have so many on the department? No, we've had a policy that all personnel mm -hmm. hired, uh, I believe it was in 1978, mm -hmm. everybody hired since that time has been an emergency medical technician. It's a condition of their mm -hmm. employment. Okay, so they have to go to school for this. So they have what to do they go. go to the local hospital? Is that Most of the, the local hospitals, uh, most of the community mm -hmm. colleges also offer emergency okay. medical programs. Mm -hmm. And they have to uh, recertify every two years, so it's an ongoing process. It's not something mm -hmm. you just get a certificate and then yeah. step back and have it. You have to keep up the training. Yes, yeah, because I, I know I can remember going through, uh, I, I can't even remember the terminology now on the uh, pulmonary help or... Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, yes, okay. CPR, right. Thank you for bringing it back. <laughs> That's how bad it is. I had to learn how to do it, and I can't even remember the terminology now. So obviously there's a... Uh, a real value and need for it to be recertified every mm -hmm. two years uh, on that. Now, you must have had occasions in Sudbury where that's saved people's lives. Oh, it, it most certainly has saved people's. We've mm -hmm. saved, uh, I'm sure there are many lives saved just because right. the, the people at accident scenes are, are much better trained and they have mm -hmm. more equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, anybody who now complains, say, of a neck injury or even sore necks, we take full mm -hmm. precautions, uh, put them on a backboard, yeah. neck braces. Mm -hmm. so that they don't end up paralyzed, and lots of people used mm -hmm. to end up paralyzed mm -hmm. as a result of improper handling at accident scenes. Mm -hmm. The EMTs have good, real good equipment now, and the town meeting just gave us money to uh, <laughs> purchase an automatic heart defibrillator. Yes, I remember that. And uh, yes, yeah. we've just had a, a demonstration on that recently by one of the companies. It looks like it's going to work out. Now, how do they Very demonstrate well. that? They don't demonstrate they have a simulator. Person, do they? No, they have a simulator that will work <laughs> along with it. And, uh, uh -huh. 
literally mm -hmm. turn the machine on and it uh, it walks you right through the steps and if it mm -hmm. does not mm -hmm. sense uh, it will not All go right. off and uh, it tells you exactly it, it says shock or do not shock and it mm -hmm. keeps repeating what for you to, for you to do something now you have this attached to the person this would be attached and this to the must person. be what taking a reading of a heartbeat for that's instance, right just or, like or a thing. you'd get at a doctor's office with an EKG mm -hmm. and prints out the little blips mm -hmm. and uh, shows the but the so, machine senses mm -hmm. everything for us but so we haven't used one of those of yet so prior to this we've always had the yeah. DMT doing the CPR the mm -hmm. compressions mm -hmm. the, we do have yeah. uh, at least one man in Sudbury in the last couple of years who was in full cardiac arrest prior to our arrival. Uh -huh. um, the EMTs did CPR until the paramedics from Emerson Hospital arrived and uh, they mm -hmm. used the defibrillator they had and got them mm -hmm. in breathing and started again and uh, he's alive today and we have a nice thank you note at the station from yeah. he and his wife and he's just fine and uh, yeah. had they not known what to do they mm -hmm. we would have lost him. Now you said the paramedics came from the hospital mm -hmm. versus you bringing him to the hospital. That's right. See, that's one of the yeah. big changes. Um, paramedics, mm -hmm. we have paramedic service available to us from both Emerson and Marlboro Hospital, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they have um, lots of equipment and they have almost all the drugs that are available mm -hmm. in the emergency room. They're in direct mm -hmm. contact, as is our ambulance at all times, with an emergency mm -hmm. room physician. And we were operating under their guidelines and what they're telling us to do. So sometimes people wonder why we're sitting in front of somebody's house and haven't raced off to the hospital. It's because the doctor is, the, everything has come to is telling us what yes, to do, yeah. and he would rather the patient be fully stabilized before we start sure. driving over yes, there. Yes. He's, he's comfortable yeah. that the patient is not going to die within the next five or ten mm -hmm. minutes, that, yeah. but he does need to be more stabilized. Maybe it's mm -hmm. more oxygen, see if the blood pressure will come down. It's, mm -hmm. Well, this eliminates the wild drive to the hospital. You know, That's having right. made one myself, I can appreciate the fact that you're <laughs> you're lucky you get there in one piece because you're so concerned That's right. about getting there in time. So that makes quite a big difference. So everyone that is on our staff or everyone who's in the fire department then is trained. Everybody is trained in the, CPR uh, and uh, 28 mm -hmm. of the 33 people are emergency mm -hmm. medical technicians. Mm -hmm. Is that how many we have, 33? We have 33 people. People now. Now, I know we now have the three fire stations. That's right. So they're located where? Uh, the Sudbury Center Station, which is underneath mm -hmm. the town hall, uh, which town meeting, again, gave us money for to hopefully build a new, or at least yes, start the yeah. plans for a new uh, central mm -hmm. fire station. Uh, station 2 is located down on Route 20, right in front of Raytheon and across the street mm -hmm. from Star Market. And Station 3 is at the corner of Route 117 and Dakin Road. Now, do we also have a reciprocal agreement with Concord for some of the areas up in North Sudbury? We used to have an agreement where Concord uh -huh. paid the town of Sudbury to protect a lot of that area up mm -hmm. there. Um, that agreement okay. stopped about four or five years ago as far oh, as Concord right. paying mm -hmm. us. Um, we still so, respond over there if we're available. Mm -hmm. uh, when they were paying us, we had a responsibility to respond, and we'd have to break an engine off from something else mm -hmm. and send them. Now we tell oh, them there. we're available, we'll go. If we're not available, we can't come. But somebody who calls into the fire department calls into a central number, right. gives an address, and then, of course, you know which engine to send. Do you have problems with people calling in being in too much of a panic to tell you where they're calling from? That's one of the, the problems. Fire. We have a couple of problems that, um, and I'm hoping that will be taken care of if the town ever gets the 911 phone system. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a great help. But at the present time, uh, there's a police emergency number and there's a fire emergency number. Mm -hmm. The fire is 443-2323. That gets you either fire engines or an ambulance. Um, if you call the police, mm -hmm. they will also, they have a direct line mm -hmm. to us. They will take information and, and pass mm -hmm. it on to us. But it's best if, okay. if you need an ambulance to call us directly because there may be additional it's questions we want to ask or something be, so we know mm -hmm. exactly how many pieces of equipment to send to somebody. Sure, because the police don't respond now to a medical emergency because Not usually, unless you we have the training in the ambulance that's right. to respond to that. And there really isn't any reason so. to you know, have an extra car there or something sure. else, so they try to, mm -hmm. unless we call them. So this would be away. something else you'd want to teach your children. This is, is true. How to call in on an emergency call or how to emergency. make an emergency call. Yeah, and you brought out a good point that lots yeah. of people, um, when they call, they're, um, they don't tell us, they say, we need an ambulance at such and such mm -hmm. an address. Sometimes mm -hmm. they forget the address they're at. Yes. Um, <laughs> problem with babysitters, or particularly younger yeah. children. Some babysitters have given us their home address and not <laughs> the address where they're babysitting. 
has been a problem. So when we help out the visiting nurses doing their babysitting courses, and we do have a firefighter mm -hmm. that handles one of those sessions, he emphasizes to them that write down the address where you're babysitting. Mm -hmm. um, Lots of babysitters know that they're babysitting for the Smiths who live two streets away. Yes, yeah. But they forget that two streets away is called sure. Pine Street or it's uh, really some other street, you know. Yeah, so this has got to be part of your training program. Part of the training program. Too, is uh, put a call. I would hope that parents who have babysitters would leave emergency numbers. So maybe some of our comments should be directed to some of the parents. The yes, parents, um, right. Do not leave enough information for yes. babysitters. A babysitter mm -hmm. should be left the number, the emergency numbers probably should be put out for the babysitters. Mm -hmm. The address should be put out for the babysitters and also where the parents can be reached that sure. evening. Uh, we've been on many calls when the babysitter mm -hmm. has called us who, and she knows the parents have gone out to dinner. But she doesn't know where. But she has no mm -hmm. idea what restaurant they've gone to. Yeah. Or in, and we've also had cases where they've told the babysitter they're going to restaurant X, and when they get there, they're mm -hmm. full, and it's an hour wait, so they go to somewhere else. Somewhere else. And uh, we've know. called mm -hmm. the restaurant was supposed to be, and they've paged them and paged them and not been able Nobody's to find the there. family. Now, in an extreme case, this could be a problem if they needed parental permission, for instance, right. can be, uh, to uh, can be a give problem. medical assistance to a, a baby or a child. Mm -hmm. So I can appreciate uh, the importance of that. It is important. And I hope parents listening <laughs> parents listening should take, take <laughs> will note appreciate of that. the importance of that, too. But people calling in, um, mm -hmm. try to stay calm when you're calling. Mm -hmm. um, the dispatcher will be asking you certain questions. Uh, we had a call mm -hmm. just last week that I listened in on for a moment, and it, it was a woman saying that somebody was dying and she needed an ambulance right away. Mm -hmm. The dispatcher took, took some of the information and... Uh, to find, I'll get the ambulance going, and it turned out that it was a it was a very young child, and I got the impression from the call that it was an older person. Uh, yes, yeah. The dispatcher had gotten the impression it was an older person, and it turned mm -hmm. out it was a very young child. Um, the child was fine on our arrival, had choked on something, but had spit it out. So by the time we got there, but you um, never know. Sure. Possibly that parent yes. had relayed the information that mm -hmm. we were talking about a baby right in the beginning of the call, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. versus. Uh, yeah. When you hear a voice, sometimes you just start to assume, and we try to train the dispatchers not to assume mm -hmm. anything, mm -hmm. to ask questions. So sometimes people say to us, why did you ask me so many questions? It's mm -hmm. so we can ferret out exactly what we're, kind of a situation we're responding to. Sure, and so at least you'll be prepared for what you're going to find. Now, you're also called in if there are road accidents, aren't you, in case of gasoline oh, yes. spill? Well, we respond to almost all accidents in mm -hmm. town just because usually somebody's been injured in the accident that we're going to take to the hospital. So okay. we're going to the accident okay, so in that regard, um, but lots as we do get there and there's been gasoline spilled or the car has started on fire as a result of the accident, mm -hmm. the batteries have shorted out or, or whatever. Yeah. Well, I know we've had a couple of fires on the road. Mm -hmm. It seems to me I remember a few of them uh, happening to us. But as a general thing, Chief, some of the tips that you've given us I think can be very helpful in saving lives. And you've told me you've already had that experience in saving lives. We have, had the, we know we've saved lives. We mm -hmm. have lots of testaments from people, the letters we get from people saying that we've done mm -hmm. it. And we know in some cases that, that what we've done has saved the life. Do you have uh, I might bring out to you that yeah, uh, the final daughter. message is to you that, yeah. and we brought it up yeah. in the CPR, that we do have mm -hmm. two fellows at the fire department that are CPR instructors, John mm -hmm. Young and mm -hmm. Frank Avery. And um, lots of people uh, set up appointments with them to recertify, or they'll also do three or four couples in a neighborhood who mm -hmm. want to get together and just learn CPR. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. at this time of year where people get swimming pools open, mm -hmm. if there are people out there who would um, like to have a CPR class or for mm -hmm. themselves or a neighbor group, um, they can call the fire department and we'll set them up with John and Frank. Well, what's the number for them to call? Oh, they call the business number on that <laughs> yeah. one, yeah. Four, I didn't think you'd want the emergency number. 443-2239. The business okay. number. So anybody who's interested in learning CPR. Learning CPR. We and again, if you have them. youngsters, this is a good thing to know. That's right. And we'll, yeah. Then you will set up a class for them. That's right. We'll and set up uh, a class and we'll show them how it's mm -hmm. done. And we have uh, lots of the mannequins that have been donated to the fire department. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. can show mm -hmm. people yes, what I, to do. <laughs> I remember them too. Well, Chief, thank you very much. Thank you for, for having me. Telling us all about these things and everything you've heard today has been for the record.